Hello, I'm Bill Morgan, president of Parker University. And with me today is Dr. Stu McGill, the world-class researcher on, sp on the lumbar spine. Stu, thanks for being with me today. No, thanks so much, Bill. It's uh, been a lot of years and uh, we've shared a lot of thoughts and ideas uh, over that time, but uh, welcome to our little BackFit Pro headquarters <laughs> here in Gravenhurst, Ontario. It's actually very impressive. The, one of the things we were just talking about informally is, is mastery. You've got a following from many people around the world, athletes, coaches, chiropractors, physicians, physical therapists, who are seeking mastery. What's your definition of mastery, clinical mastery? Well, it's going to take me more than one sentence, but basically it's this, and you may not like the analogy, but let me start with the car mechanic. I don't know how many car mechanics there would be in the United States, but let's pick a number, say there's 30,000. How many of those car mechanics can consistently produce a car to win your fuel dragsters, your uh, Indianapolis 500, and F1, and then go down and win Baja for the off-road. You would need to be a master car mechanic to understand the requirements of each one of those vehicles and then tune it so it would survive the race and win. Uh, so that is my definition of mastery. They know the science, but they also are able to play jazz with that vehicle and tune it. And I can think of my uh, father when he would look at an engine and say, uh, you know, the end bearing is gone on the main crank and people would look at him. Uh, because today's mechanics would look at the computer code to see if, and of course, a ba main bearing is not going to show on the computer cord. But he would get a wooden dowel and listen to the engine block, and he knew exactly where the, uh, the problem was. And uh, now the clinical master is someone who's very familiar with the scientific code and the rules of how the spine and this articulated linkage works. But then they have the years of experience of knowing how uh, a certain athlete or a certain person presented. They know what they were told to do. They considered the impediments of why they had failed in the past. They put all of this together and then they know the precise dosage and uh, how to interval train the, the exposure and create the unleashing of pain-free activity that has eluded all the predecessors, all the so-called clinical masters, but in fact were not. They were imposters. Uh, but the one who consistently makes the difference is the master. We, and we also talked about the in of one. We have this vast array of scientific research and it's sometimes it's, it's confusing. You'll, you'll have some, one person you know, with the Williams exercises pr proposed flexion exercises for everybody. McKinsey extension. Uh, another group from Australia would have core hollowing to, to activate the multifidus. There's been so many things over the years, but we always are trying as clinicians trying to bring it down to what's what's the best for this patient before me? How do, how do we determine what's best for that patient? Well, there's no such thing in our view of non-specific back pain. It's always highly specific and it starts with a very thorough assessment. Now, even the assessment is a living process. Would any master clinician give the same assessment to a 70-year-old as they would to a 20-year-old uh, football, uh, professional football candidate? Of course, the assessment was very, very different. The older person, their biggest risk is a slip and a fall. And the younger person might be, how are they going to survive the uh, weight training and speed program to get ready to play the game? So as the assessment changes, it is thorough enough to really reveal what the specific motions, postures, loads are that cause the stress concentrations to cause an overload on a tissue, a pain sensitivity, or outright tissue damage. And uh, that then gives a roadmap. But then we have to get right back to the science. What is the scientific code that governs how that particular tissue adapts? So let's say we have a, a muscle issue. Um, we know that micro tearing of muscles is what bodybuilders do when they're training and it takes uh, a, a couple of days approximately to uh, adapt that muscle. It grows and comes back stronger. But if we have a person who's overtraining their back with heavy deadlifts, um, when you look at how the grand old men and women of powerlifting train, they might do heavy squats for one day and then take five days off. 
because the, the adaptation of bone and to get the new bone to scaffold in where we had very, at the molecular level, microfracturing, uh, it takes five days. So isn't it interesting that uh, it was the, the assessment within the code that then showed you're overtraining and that's why you're getting this cumulative trauma to a bony element of the back and that might be why you're in pain. So as we keep honing down and peeling the onion, if you will, with every patient, we find that the categories become smaller and smaller and smaller until we're at the subject end of one. That one patient, we know quite precisely the cause, we know quite, quite precisely the, the dosage, but we know their prior history, we know their age, we know all of these other things and their anatomy, etc. The prescription and the, and the treatment plan is going to be slightly different and slightly tuned. And then we will unleash the magic and follow up, most importantly, to make sure that we actually did make a difference. Follow up, and, and for us, for me, in my clinical career, one of the goals was to restore not just normal function, but get them into broad-based fitness. If you could progress a patient from being incapacitated to being where they're able to do not just their normal activities, but having a, a express broad base of fitness and being able to do activities is a really a good indicator of, a, of health. Now, as chiropractors, we pride ourselves on being the master of the, of the adjustment, manipulation. Some joints move too much, some joints move too little. There's some, some patients need stability, some need the adjustment. Um, what recommendations would you give a chiropractor in the field for assessing hypermobility versus hypomobility? Well, uh, you know the answer once again, it depends. And uh, where we would start with that is, uh, the, the question is easy if there's pain. And then the answer is, what takes their pain away? And then the next level is, what foundation do the, does that person need to withstand the stresses? So if they're going to be a power lifter, they usually need more stiffness than the average person to build that structure to bear load. But if we have someone who wants to be a gymnast or a modern dancer or something as specialized as a pitcher in baseball, now we have mobility at the expense of load bearing. We have elastic uh, athleticism. Mm -hmm. uh, we're tuning elasticity, which is not so much just the continuum between st uh, stiffness and uh, mobility now. We have to tune the springs to store and recover elastic energy. So you can throw a ball 100 miles an hour and that kind of thing. So it gets very interesting how we're going to keep tuning this uh, body. So how I would advise a chiropractor, uh, and by the way, it would be no different than I would advise anybody else. Uh, I, I have no, uh, I, I couldn't care less whether the person is uh, a, a chiropractor or uh, an osteopath or a, a, a physical therapist or an athletic therapist. It makes no difference to me. Uh, but what I, I do want from them is the commitment to understand how this system works with all of the various elements that uh, influence and, and place force. And I don't mean force in a mechanical sense. It could be a psychological force or a social force. All the things that are forcing this system. Um, now I've lost my place again. Do you see why I had to retire, Bill? That's, that's all right. <laughs> I have, I have a, a, a great interest in reactionary stiffness of, of the body. That right. It reacts. Of course. And I know you've done some studies where the small muscles of the spine, the rotatories, the interspinalis muscles, the intertransversary eyes, I think that there's eight times the number of muscle spindle fibers in those muscles. And they're the most a, spindle rich. I don't know the number. I think it's four times than the next muscle, but nonetheless, they're the most spindle rich. They're, they're really rich. So you have this these small muscles that are very you know, insignificant as contractile tissue, but as, as being uh, transducers to, to recognize a stretch or a need for stiffening. Is, is there not a reflex arc that goes yep. to the spine back to the, to the, the core? Okay, there are, there are very uh, few chiropractors that I run into that are aware of some of the science, very foundational for the manipulation that we've done. Uh, I have to go back now 
1994, where I was a visiting professor at the medical school in, uh, in, in Bern, in Switzerland. And uh, we were implanting intramuscular electrodes into the deep muscles of the spine. So we got into psoas and quadratus lumborum for the first time and uh, the three layers of the abdominal wall and, and whatnot. Well, one morning I walked into the uh, uh, operating room where we would implant these electrodes and the surgeon was putting in electrodes into his own spine with a, with a mirror. And uh, I, uh, he got right up against the bone and we were, we're getting rather odd signals and I, was, I, I saw where the probe was with uh, ultrasound and I was quite sure he was in one of the small rotators laid up right against the uh, uh, bony margin of the vertebra. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, he sat on the side of the table and I held him like this and I said, try and twist one way. And there was no signal from this muscle. But remember, the anatomy books say the small rotators rotate the spine. But as we know, the anatomical descriptions in anatomy books are very rarely accurate. And then I held, I held him and I said, try and twist the other way. Nothing. If the motor control system was going to get those muscles to activate twist, they would have been activated, but they weren't. And then I said, try and twist one way. Nothing. Twist the other. Electrical storm. The most spindle-rich muscle found thus far are the small rotators of the spine. So if you're a scientist, a neuroscientist, trying to harvest muscle spindles, you get them out of the small rotators. But uh, in any case, uh, they were length transducers. The muscles became active and fired as a function of length. So they're telling the proprioceptive system all the time the position of the joints of your spine. So that was the first part of the story. The second part of the story was from the uh, Indian scientist, Marcus David Andan, who was a muscle spindle specialist. And it was him who told me, yes, I harvest the spindles to study from uh, monkeys and we get them from the small rotators uh, of the spine. Yet again, they are the most uh, spindle rich uh, length transducers. Then we began to measure uh, what the chiropractic manipulation did with our instrumentation, which was rather unique at the time, uh, we would have people, uh, I remember one was a, uh, uh, not on our Olympic team just yet, but they were trying to make our Olympic team, and they were a gymnast, but they had a very small, uh, funny sensation in their oblique wall. And uh, she described it as, I've got this muscle spasm in my obliques. Well, there's this discussion in chiropractic that what does the manipulation do? Does it just do things that are paraspinal or does it go throughout the body? Well, here's an interesting question. That's not near the spine. That, that's quite a distance away. So anyway, we had a chiropractor manipulate her spine within 300 milliseconds, that spasm dropped to about half its amplitude. So there was something in the manipulation that had a neurological, but a, an electrical effect, if you want to think of it that way, uh, more than mechanical at this point. So it might have been a mechanic. What I think happened was they stretch the uh, muscle spindles in the small rotators, and then they give that little tweak at the end. And it's like, we all have Microsoft computers, and when they get a little bit discombobulated, you hit the Control-Alt-Delete yeah. reset. Yes, reboot it. So it, it, it's a reboot, and uh, within 300 milliseconds, meaning it was a short loop reflex, the uh, muscle spasm dropped to about a half, proving two things. It was a neurophysiological short loop reflex. It was the only candidate mechanism that would fit that time. And secondly, um, Oh, it wasn't right next to the spine. It was something some distance away. Uh, then we uh, continued the experiment with a few other uh, people, and we found in a short loop reflex amount of time, some muscle spasms were induced, which wasn't a good thing. So yet again, you know, as we see with every treatment, there is the possibility for something positive. There's a possibility for something uh, not so positive. 
And uh, that's the way it is. But uh, we recognize uh, some of the mechan mechanisms now after doing that work. But that was, uh, you don't reach mastery by an experiment or looking for a paper on X in the literature. You get it from putting studies together and lines of logic. That's, that's how, and it, you know, the, these, I call them the children, the children on the internet. Oh, there's no study that shows this, oh so gosh. therefore it doesn't exist. And I, and I think, no, it doesn't exist because you haven't lived long enough and you haven't seen enough patients, nor have you done enough experiments yet to put the stories together so you understand how uh, whatever that phenomenon was that you were trying to interpret and then how you recognize that in a patient and put it together. Well, would it be logical to say we've got these muscle spindle fibers this very rich tissue that react to stretching of them, and that they've, there's been a reflex arc back to the multifidus, and then when they've done studies where they've had a, a, an adjustment to the spine, that you have increased activity of the multifidus, and it lingers for up to a week afterwards, that the adjustment has, has, has reactivated a, a inhibited multifidus. Would, as, as you put the, these articles together, is, can you say that possibly that adjustment could be part of a rehab um, program that can help reactivate the multifidus? Or am I, am I reading too much into the, uh, the points along the way? Well, I don't know because I haven't been uh, a party in that line of logic. However, I'm not going to be able to dismiss it either. So all I'm going to say at this point, I'm not the world's expert in that little line of logic that you just created. But there, the, someone will be, but then I want to hear that story again, and uh, let's put the logic together, and uh, if it holds water, and we have dismissed all of the alternate explanations through scientific inquiry, I'm uh, becoming quite happy. A, a chiropractic was based on the premise of a nerve interference, and, and we're trying to, to mitigate that nerve interference. The original theory was pressure directly on a nerve, it could be you have a dysfunctional segment that's, that, that has, with the adjustment, you've, you've reactivated those muscle spindle fibers and reactivated the neural reflex that would be normal for that person. Could that be a theory that would, we could move forward? I think so. I think uh, some of what the story I just told two or three minutes ago would uh, lend itself to that as a very, very viable uh, proposition. Uh, but, you know, I, you've, we've known each other long enough. I can't answer any questions without starting off. It depends. Let's give a mechanical explanation, and you may or may not like this. Um, when we would inject a disc with, uh, maybe I was introducing an artificial disc or a, a, a polymer gel substitute or something like that. When you put the needle bore through the annulus of the disc, and do your work and then pull the bore out, nucleus would leak out the hole. So there's one layer of collagen on the outside of the disc. The next layer runs this way. In other words, they run crisscross like this. Now I'm just gonna create a core hole like this so you can see it in the camera. And then I'm gonna pull the bore through. Everyone sees the hole. Now I tried to seal that up with gels, surgical cements, all kinds of things to get that to seal. Do you know what the most effective seal was? A chiropractic manipulation where I lined the fibers like that. So there's the core hole, <coughs> closed. It was the most effective, fastest way I could get to close that uh, delamination. And it was simply mechanical stress. So you had lax collagen fibers. I stiffened them one way and I stiffened them the other way. And we're, we're, we're all aligned. Um, I've uh, shown this to uh, various physicians who inject uh, knees and hips with uh, oh, uh, the viscous gels and collagen bases and stem cells and PRP and all the rest of it. And then they start moving the joint around afterwards and I say, what are you doing? You're supposed to be closing the core hole. If it's a hip, you go internal external rotation and the, and the, and the a capsule seals up right away. So, well, you know, and now how did I know this? It's because I'm probably the only guy who's cored these various tissues and I can see it and I can see the leaking out. But it's not they published any place that nobody knows about. That's right. 
Oh, then, therefore, in some people's minds, it doesn't exist. <laughs> we had somebody talk about we should never use MRI or X-ray because from a public health standpoint, worldwide health standpoint, it, it, would, it, it increases the burden on society because you're having less, you're spending a lot of money on, th on this technology while there's a lot of people suffering. And my response was, well, if you really want to, to, to change the argument to, from a, a worldwide health, health um, public health issue, close down all the MRIs and, and provide clean drinking water to everybody in the underserved world. That's not, that's not realistic either, though. There's a value to MRIs, there's a value to x-rays, there's a value to your clinical experience knowing or, or your experience seeing that in, in a laboratory, you will seal a disc with manipulation by adjusting that. Why can't you apply that? If it works on your patient, then it works. Well, I mean, I, I don't even know how to respond, of course. <laughs> So, so a chiropractor who wanted to learn more about like, like uh, wh what you're about, and a, lo a lot of what you've written about is about spinal stiffness and the importance for spinal stiffness. And then the, the, there's mobility and stiffness. Where do we fit into that? Where's, you know, how do we increase mobility where we need more mobility? How do we increase stiffness where we need more stiffness in the spine? May I get a model? You please. Well, to have a discussion about the continuum of stability, mobility, we really have to talk about laxity and stiffness. So no engineer would build a flexible rod, hold it up in the air and ask it to bear compression. They would choose a rigid rod. But uh, we still need to uh, uh, have mobility sufficient for us to dance, uh, breathe, have a baby. Uh, tie our shoe, have sex to procreate, or forever. No, I'm not. Right. We, we better <laughs> check that. <laughs> but uh, so, of course, a mobile spine is a wonderful thing to have. However, if you then take that mobile spine and ask it to bear load, it will buckle and fall. So, what you do is you build a, it, when, when you look at the architecture of the muscles of the torso or the spine, uh, they are arranged as a guy wire system. This becomes a ship's mast. They can then now stiffen and allow that mast to bear load. So if I'm, I'm just gonna stiffen this, there we go. So there is a spine stiffened by, I've got core stability now. I'm ready to lift, I'm ready to bear load. Uh, that will survive perturbations and bear load. But if I reduce the guy wire muscular force and stiffness, then it can't even support its own body weight. Now, when we do that with a spine and we take it out of a cadaver, it buckles at about 20 pounds. So just alone, a, a spine will fail. It can't even support the weight of your head. So all the time you have a certain amount of background activity just so you can hold your spine nice and tall. Uh, but then it's a hell of a coordination uh, task to then uh, move and uh, keep what we call sufficient stability. So there's a beginning of a discussion of stability uh, and mobility. You need muscle activity, and remember when a muscle contracts, it creates force and stiffness. So the, the uh, very strong muscle won't allow the joint to move. Uh, that's why when we measure in, in great athletes, they're pulsing. So they're strength pulsers. If I was going to throw a punch, I would start with a pulse, relax, pulse, boom, boom. Otherwise, I, I wouldn't be able to have any speed at all. To hit a golf ball a long way, try and hit a golf ball a long way using muscle and you'll find it doesn't go very far because of the stiffness it slows down the uh, the swing so the great golfers have, as we've measured and uh, I can stand by this are masters at pulsing storing elastic energy releasing it with tuned muscle stiffness uh, and force well then we get down to issues uh, such as when a joint becomes 
uh, slightly damaged. It loses its stiffness. So think of a, an ACL deficient knee. The clinician does a drawer test on the knee and they will find laxity or loss of stiffness to measure the joint integrity. Well, we do exactly the same thing, uh, you and I doing our shear tests on a spine. We test the uh, shear stiffness. So you can see there's a very stiff joint. But look at the motion now taking place uh, at the joint that's had a little bit of disc damage and it's lost a little bit of disc height. This isn't degenerative disc disease. This is true damage. And when we see the diagnosis of degenerative disc disease and a flattened disc, it's almost always the disc that has more aberrant micro movements and uh, we can prove whether or not that is the source of pain. Um, but nonetheless, we can then take out that aberrant micro movement causing pain by teaching a patient certain stiffness uh, strategies. We might ask them to put your fingers into the lateral abdominal wall, push the fingers out, now repeat the offending movement or activity that was triggering the pain. Is it more or is it less? If it's less, you've engineered out the painful micro movements by adding stiffness. If it's more, the structure didn't have the, uh, the tolerance to the compressive load, which is a penalty, of stability. So you have to figure out another way to do it. But uh, anyway, and then let's go to the uh, uh, next extreme, which will be very uh, interesting to a manipulative uh, clinician. All of these spines are direct casts and models of real people. And uh, our mutual colleague, Jerome Fryer, who runs Dynamic Disc Designs, makes these wonderful biofidelic models. So we can watch this spine uh, segment of uh, three vertebra with two motion segments. Notice how it moves quite normally as I flex and extend it. But if I extend it too much, so there's the person moving into extension, and then look what happens now. These joints have now bound up and there's no motion anymore and all the motion now is, is relegated to the joint below. But it's because they have a little bit of facet arthritis in there. Now the manipulative guru would then know how to pop it up and restore the motion. So you can bind it up with certain motions and I'm going to pop and now we've got normal motion again. So that was uh, uh, not non-specific pain, it was highly specific, but there would be an example where just the right amount of mobility would restore normal joint function and the clinician would know immediately whether or not they took the patient to less pain, no pain, or more pain. So you can actually be adjusting the hypermobile segment to get normal facet mechanics. It can go both ways. Absolutely it can. Yeah. Oh. So, you, we, you know, the, the, it, it's a fault of many uh, orthopedic uh, surgeons and people who follow just strictly orthopedics. They will look at a medical image being at uh, an MR and there might be a very nasty looking segment. Let's say L4, L5. And you see lots of bone spurs and they'll say, okay, there's the site of disc degeneration, which we don't really believe in very much. And yet, when you test it, and then when you look at video fluoroscopy, for example, or you could even see this with real-time ultrasound, all the motion is now at the joint above and you do some probes and you figure out, yes, that's a site of pain. It's not the nasty one on MR at all. It's the opposite. So there's an example where it's now not the arthritic degenerative joint that is the source of pain. It's the one above that is very good looking on an MR, but that's where all the stress is concentrated. It's too mobile. Look deeper. Don't look for the, it's obvious. So be a, ma a master is to be able to see past the osteophytes and spurs and, and, and continue to search until you actually find the, the, the source of the problem and treating that. Well, it's a one-to-one -one link between what a master clinician determines as the pain source and then you confirm it on the MR. We, we had a wonderful discussion this morning where we were talking about uh, we might find 
uh, pain coming from a certain nerve root when we do a specific test to put tensile stress on that nerve root. We know that that's the pain generator, but why? Well, it wasn't until we got the MRI where we saw, well, it's a Tarlov cyst. And we would never have known that without that level of uh, investigation. So no amount of stretching uh, is, is going to help that person. Uh, chances are, if it's an advanced cyst with a lots of uh, corrosive bone around that cyst that we both uh, talked about as well, uh, we probably will not be able to give the person the unique guidance that took their pain away, or at least gave them a plan for appropriate treatment. Well, thank you so much for talking about mastery today, and thank you for having us here today. Thanks so, so much, Bill. Right, it's Steve. been a great pleasure. Thank you, Steve.